about rigidity. Its uh, rigidity is what uh, gave rise to the expectation that higher rank groups are arithmetic, yes. which is eventually proved by Margulis. So, subject is rigidity. But before I go on to rigidity, let me make a number of uh, comments <coughs> about uh, subgroups of linear groups. So, the first thing is if gamma g l n c so finitely generated subgroup linear group then gamma contains torsion free subgroup of finite index. This is uh, <coughs> I think this is already due to Maybe already due to Minkowski. No, not quite. I'll tell you, it's uh, in some sense essentially due to Minkowski, we can say. <coughs> anyway, the the proof. So we'll consider consider first the case. In gamma C G L N q bar, the algebraic torsion of q. In this case, then actually gamma is contained in g l n k for some number field, some finite extension of q already because the generators are finitely many. Look at the set of entries of <coughs> the generator and take the field generated by them, then you are going to get everything. <coughs> For some number field, <coughs> it also implies that gamma is in G L N integers with some number of <coughs> elements inverted P R primes in Q P I. So, this ring, which, uh, <coughs> this collection of primes, let us call it S, and this is nothing but S inverse, this ring is usually denoted S inverse OK. <coughs> the point about S inverse OK is that <coughs> uh, any proper ideal. in S in was OK is an additive subgroup of finite index. In other words, S in was OK modulo a non zero ideal. Finite ring. So, one way of getting subgroups of finite is gamma would be to look at gamma sitting inside GLN <coughs> of S inverse OK and pass the quotient by an ideal. Inside SN is OK. Subgroup of 
some ideal this is a finite ring i mean this, this ring is a finite ring therefore this group is finite and so the kernel is going to a finite index the point is that <coughs> can choose a such that kernel we call this pi a kernel pi a has no torsion a torsion an element has torsion means what one of its uh, eigen values its eigen values are all roots of unity some some power of n vanishes so its eigen values are roots of unity now this is a number field <coughs> and notice that uh, any if gamma and gamma has torsion so that is gamma power r equals 1 this <coughs> notice that the, if you look at the characteristic polynomial of gamma is a polynomial of degree polynomial in of degree n with coefficients in k. So, <coughs> if it this would be in suppose gamma is torsion element, then the corresponding r root affinity, the eigenvalues are all r root affinity, r root affinity will have to satisfy a polynomial of degree n over the number field. Now, it is a uh, fact from number theory that the uh, yeah. yeah there are only finitely many roots of 1 satisfying polynomials of degree n over k. So, let us list them. Let P1, P2, P and B, these cyclotomic polynomials. Okay. Cyclotomic means polynomial, minimal polynomials of roots of unity. <coughs> These are polynomials with note they are polynomials actually with integral coefficients. Pi are actually in OK. <coughs> now, Pi gamma is 0. Suppose <coughs> you choose, choose an ideal A. such that p i mod a what do I want now I want uh, p i mod a <coughs> is not x power n minus 1 just to ensure that pi point a is not x power n minus 1. <coughs> then claim then gamma kernel pi has no torsion because if we take a torsion element <coughs> 
it will go to something. So it's a it's to satisfy pi equal to pi of uh, gamma equal to one. I should say, sorry. It, <coughs> If I take a torsion element and take its uh, one of its eigenvalues, then it will satisfy the condition pi of that equals zero. Uh, so sorry, uh, yeah, I should probably is not x power n this point. Mm -hmm. So if I take the corresponding image here, it sets the satisfy the same polynomial. And if it's not zero, so pi of pi bar, of, I mean, it's, it's not this polynomial. So pi reduced modulo a is not going to, gamma is not going to satisfy pi reduced modulo a. Therefore, the original gamma cannot also satisfy the equation. So it has no torsion. No. <coughs> so then, uh, pi has no torsion. So any all the, all the reviews is finally generated and of course I have used the fact that it has entries in the number field. The gamma is supposed to have entries in the number field. But how do I get over this? The idea is this. Consider a set R gamma of all homomorphisms of gamma in GLN. Now write gamma as free group modulo some normal subgroup. Possibly generated by countable, countable number of elements. It's always any quotient. <coughs> I take a free group by some normal gamma is free group by some normal subgroup. The normal subgroup will be assumed to be countably generated. I, my, my gamma is always countable, I should have said that, finally generated, therefore it is countable anyway. <coughs> now, if you look at all homomorphisms of uh, the free group, f and g, this is same as product of g, this is uh, say <coughs> L copies, where L is the number of generators. Free group is a free group on set of generators. So, yeah, is a, is a, any home of the free group into G, you just have to say what the image of this generator is by the universal property of the free group. Is. So, if you know the L elements here, then you get the home of the free group. Now, so this you have pi G, and for each of these alpha I, I have home of them back into G. Alpha is after all a word in all the generators. So if the generators here are this is G1, G2, GL, and if alpha i is in the generators, some word uh, I didn't give the name, say u1 power r1, u2 power r2, etc., uk power rk, something in the generators, then you just have to map this into the corresponding g1 power. R1 G2 power R2, etc. GK power RK. And if the element corresponds to a homomorphism of gamma rather than F, it means every one of these alpha I will take the, that element into 1. This condition is an algebraic condition. There are infinitely many conditions, but then the our algebra of uh, our uh, rings are noetherian and so on. The, the, the algebraic variety is noetherian character. Therefore, you find that <coughs> the set of gamma, this set of homomorphisms, home, which I called R gamma there, R gamma is an algebraic sub variety defined over Q. Because you, the condition is simply. The multiplication in GLN is defined over Q and therefore the whole thing is defined over Q. And therefore this implies R gamma has a Q bar point. In other words, the, the original inclusion may take it into some field, but I can move it 
inside the variety here to reach a point which is algebraic. And that al at the, where the point is algebraic, I know that the, the it has a subgroup of finite this which is torsion. That is, I have uh, so. So, if rho in R gamma is an algebraic point, I know that rho gamma has a subgroup phi, which is torsion free subgroup phi of finite index. That is what we proved here earlier. Now, see during the deformation, <coughs> we made sure that every the normal subgroup generates the, the, the relations is given by normal some normal subgroup, and every element of the, we have made sure that the generator of the normal subgroup all go into one here, which means all elements in the normal subgroup will go to one. Okay. Now let us look at what happens to theta. Suppose theta is a torsion element in gamma. That means theta power q will be equal to 1 for some q. That means theta power q is in my normal subgroup of relations. And therefore, rho theta, rho theta power q is also 1. And that means rho theta power q is not, rho theta is not in phi. Because phi is a subgroup of finite which is torsion free, rho theta cannot be in phi. This implies rho inverse phi has no torsion. That shows that every finite generated subgroup has a subgroup of finite index which is torsion free. You know, we did this, uh, I mean, we remarked that the congruent subgroups in GLN O, OK, or all, yeah. all that we are doing is, I mean, the part, all, all that I am saying is a suitable congruent subgroup of GLN S inverse OK, even if I invert a few primes, the suitable congruent subgroup is, has no torsion. So, in fact, what we have proved is the process if k is a number field and this is a finite set of primes, then there exists an ideal A in S inverse OK such that GLN kernel GLN non zero ideal S inverse OK to GLN S inverse OK modulo A is torsion free. The suitable congruence of group is always torsion free. This kernel means a set of elements E in GLN S inverse OK. T i j common to delta i j modulo. This is what we proved in the case when the entries are number field and the general case is used by some deformation argument and Hilbert notion and such.
Okay, that is one fact. Now, see, so fix a gamma finitely generated group. An element rho in R gamma is rigid. The following thing happens if the orbit of rho under inner conjugation. Let me write, sorry. See, uh, I talked about the space R gamma with ga home of the gamma and J ln C. I can do it for any G. You do not have to bother about J ln C. So, G D group, and I look at the mostly algebraic group, and I look, let me write R gamma G all homomorphisms of gamma. Exactly as here, if G is an algebraic group, R gamma J acquires a structure as an algebraic parity. In any case, it is a natural structure of topological space, R gamma J. <coughs> an element R gamma G is rigid if the following thing happens. If the orbit of rho under the inner conjugation by G is open in R gamma J. That is everything close to rho, every, every homomorphism close to rho comes from rho by linear conjugation by G. So, for instance, if you have a one parameter family of homomorphisms, so rho t as t varies over the interval, so homomorphism and rho naught is rigid, then every rho t becomes conjugate to rho naught for t sufficiently close to the origin. That is what it would imply. That is why the name rigidity. And here is a theorem, I do not know if it is the following, rho in R gamma G is rigid if H 1 gamma at composed with rho Add is the adjoint representation of G in its Lie algebra so rho is the given represent compose add with rho you get a representation of uh, gamma add composed with rho representation of gamma in not G if the group first group cohomology with co add composed with rho is zero then it is rigid and this is uh, basically a consequence of uh, the inverse function theorem or implicit function theorem if you like. The idea is this, uh, firstly, mm, yeah, uh, maybe, okay, the point is this, <coughs> once again, write gamma as quotient of a free group modulo some normal subgroup. I have gamma equal to f by n, <coughs> f free group on some finite number on a finite set. Okay. Now, what happens is this if you look at g cross g cross g. Oh yes, I want to say something. So, this is on a finite set of L elements say. So, you take G cross G cross G L copies and then the N will give you a number of relations which will go into number of uh, 
points. Again, product each element of n. A priori, you get a home of mapping into a countable product. Yes. But because of the notary in nature of uh, the varieties and so on, you can already some finite number will do the job. some few copies. In any case, you can assume the group for all practical rules, you can assume gamma to finitely presented, in which case you can take this to be finitely generated normally and then it is a g cross g cross g and then you have mapping to this. Okay. And we also have a mapping of g into this. If I fix, fix a, represent, a fixed representation row, this is the <coughs> let me call this, this this mapping I will call nu and this uh, I'll, this is the orbit map so to speak. So, I will call it O, O g will be 0 g inverse conjugate rho by g. Okay. Now, the tangent space these are both manifolds, the, all three are manifolds. The tangent space here is simply product of so many copies of the Lie algebra that can be viewed as a one cross cycle on the free group with coefficients in add composed with rho. Any one cross cycle simply and the orbit under rho, the tangent space of the orbit becomes simply the boundaries, one co boundaries. Okay. And the kernel of the differential op this is of course the product of g's and kernel of the differential operators and each one of them will be the evaluation you have chosen certain generators for the normal subgroup say psi 1 psi 2 psi q generators of the subgroup each one of them will be the, the tangent map becomes the this becomes a tangent space series one cross cycles and the tangent map corresponding to psi 1 each one of them gives you a tangent map, each one of them is evaluated to that cycle on psi 1. These are all easy to prove, they are not a once, once stated, you have to notice it and that is all. Okay. So, what you find is that the kernel of d nu and the image of d o, if the cohomology vanishes, these two are going to be equal because the, the, those, those cocycles which under d nu go to 0 are precisely cocycles sit in gamma. I mean, they are 0 on the normal subgroup. So, they are factored to the gamma and they are 1 cocycles on gamma. So, the point is tangent space to g cross g l copies equals natural isomorphic to one cross cycles on f with coefficients in I still write I, I compose the row I treat row also representative f with the representation of gamma compose get a representative yeah. cross cycles <coughs> and kernel d nu can be identified the space of one cross cycles on f which are 0 on f. So, therefore, which implies the same as space of 1 cocycles on gum with coefficients in that composed. And image DO, the orbit map is the space of one co boundaries. For add composite row. For uh, one co boundaries, whether it is uh, free group or gamma, it is the same because you know, GV minus V is what you want to take. So, it is going to be the same space. So, if h1 gamma add composed with rho is 0. This means the tangent map t at the point 
रो एज आइडेंटिटी पर जी टू द ट्रांजन स्पेस ऑफ एट रो पर जी क्रॉस जी क्रॉस जी इन टू दट सो डिस इज ट्रांजन स्पेस मैप इज डी वो एंड देन दट इज डी नू विच इज ट्रांजन स्पेस एट द इमेज पॉइंट सो ट्रांज स्पेस एट नू रो of g cross g cross g q factors now and these are l factors this sequence is exact this is space of one cross cycle of the free group okay. and this is some space i don't care but the kernel of this map yeah. is precisely the image is what i'm saying kernel is precisely cross cycles on gamma and that is the image now it's this is an immediate consequence of this is that the image of so if you have varieties v1 to v2 to v3 suppose the corresponding tan tangent map is exact that is suppose at some point v not in v1 tv not of v1 to tv not of image of v not also denote v v2 to tv3 if this sequence is exact the inverse function theorem will immediately tell you that the image of v1 is open in the fiber okay okay the image will go into the, into the fiber okay yeah. the fiber through v0 the image of v, v1 in the fiber through v0 is a whole this is the inverse function theorem as easily checked what would be the consequence of uh, what would be an interesting consequence of rigidity now i know that the we, we have already seen that this if g is an algebraic group the variety the r gamma is a variety defined over q because all this things are defined over q and therefore once i know that the orbit is open that means in the, in the neighborhood there are going to be algebraic points nusser sage will tell you that there are going to be it's an open orbit in open set there always is this so after conjugation everything is entered into a number field if h1 gamma add is zero h1 rho rho can be conjugated into a representation which takes everything to a number field let's see that's a con immediate consequence so let me write this down I said it's rigid. Rigidity implies there exists G in G as a zero G inverse G some k k number field. Well, of course, for this I have to assume that this algebraic group or a number field. Does that be Q? And start with any algebraic group or number field, and then all these morphisms which you define here are all defined over that number field, and therefore it has a point, a k bar rational point, in uh, sorry, k k bar defined over number field k. Then there exists G in G, so that zero G inverse G rho x. G inverse is in G K bar for every x in gamma. All the elements of gamma can be conjugated into generators are going to number field, and then everything else. Now. For instance, if you have a yeah, let me. So, for uh, lattices in a semi-simple group, if they are going to be arithmetic, there is a good chance that they are rigid. I mean, the, the lattices uh, doesn't say it's already into 
number field. Okay. Okay. Yeah. But an arithmetic group means it has to be in some number field. And therefore, now if it were rigid, if I can say that any lattice is rigid, then any lattice can be conjugated into a number field. That's what would be the condition. So one looks for this property of rigidity. Come. Reason one look for it is that notice that uh, discrete. There are lots of discrete subgroups uh, inside SL two, which are which are not rigid. In fact, we have we know that. So the uniformization theorem. For Riemann surfaces, asserts that every compact surface of genus G greater than two, greater than equal to two, is of the form the upper half plane. Let me give it a name, the Riemann surface S yes, or X, let us say. Form H modulo a certain where H is the upper half plane and gamma X. Is a discrete torsion free subgroup of PSL two R, which is the group of holomorphic automorphisms of the upper half plane H. And one knows further that X is isomorphic to Y as a compact Riemann surface. If and only if gamma X is conjugate to gamma Y in PSL 2R. You know, gamma x is the fundamental group of x, and so it is a fixed structure. If y is another surface, the same genus, of course, it is also the same, and therefore you will get various discrete subgroups. In other words, each gamma, if, if I fix one genus, and then I have the fundamental group of that Riemann surface, which has a fixed structure, call it gamma, then every Riemann surface is got by through some homomorphism of gamma into PSL 2R, which is injective one to one and the image discrete. So, it is like this, uh, uh, yeah, let gamma equals subgroup generated by uh, AI, BI, to G. With the relations modulo product AI BI A inverse BI inverse I equal to 1 to G. Modulo subgroup generated by this, normal subgroup generated by this. That is the structure of the fundamental group of Riemann surface. If I call that gamma, gamma G, let us say the genus G. Then Look at R, let me write R not gamma G to be the set of elements PSL2, set of elements, set of homomorphisms rho gamma to PSL2 R the property rho is 1, 1 and Rho gamma is discrete in <coughs> PSL to R.
look at this set, then the uniformization theorem can be reformulated saying R naught gamma gamma g PSL to R modulo inner conjugation by g, the quotient is in bijective correspondence. with isomorphism classes of Riemann surfaces of genus this is the upshot of what we have already discussed. You need to given any Riemann surface you get h by gamma x but and suppose why is another Riemann surface in the same genus then gamma x and gamma y are equal are isomorphic and they are all isomorphic to this particular group which I wrote uh, this one. It's, it's a free group on 2G generators with one relation. So, you find you have this. Now, it is uh, well known from complex geometry that there are lots of non-isomorphic Riemann of the same genus G. In fact, there are 3G minus 3 parameterized parameters which vary Riemann surface of fixed genus. It's known. Compact. So, you get, so in particular that, uh, yeah, compact ones. So in particular, yeah, six the, 3G minus, huh? uh, uh, minus 3. Complex, complex. complex. Because of that, uh, the, in fact, the set of Riemann surfaces, I mean, isomorphism class Riemann surfaces of uh, 3G minus 3 constitute a, a complex manifold of dimension 3G minus 3, so fixed genus G. And because of that, uh, it's clear the, this group, the fundamental group of Riemann surface sitting inside PSO2 is not rigid. However, it, Selberg discovered that SL2 is a joker in the pack, so to speak. For every other semi simple group, every other simple group, any discrete subgroup with compact quotients, yeah, these are of course discrete subgroup with compact quotients automatically. They prove that for a discrete subgroup with compact quotients, it's rigid. Actually, Selberg proved it for SLNR. Take any discrete subgroup of SLNR with compact quotient, he proved it is rigid. And then Andre Bell went on to generalize it for any simple D group other than SL2R. So, let me just state the, I mean, so for compact quotients, this was proved by Selberg by a somewhat geometric argument, and but Weyl later gave an argument which involved cohomology. In fact, the formulation that uh, H1 gamma add equals 0 implies rigidity is essentially due to Weyl. So, let me embark on this statement. So, the theorem is after the following. Let G be a connected semi simple Lie group with no compact factors. And gamma and G, a discrete subgroup such that its projection on any factor. G of dimension 3 is dense in that factor. Hmm? Yeah, yeah. Any simple E group is a product of simple E groups, yeah. and I demand that no simple uh, is factor is compact. 
it I am allowing factors of PSL2 or SL2. Three dimensional, the only three dimensional Lie groups, uh, non compact Lie groups, uh, was, uh, say, uh, I am already throwing out compact factors. Once I throw out compact factors, the only non compact simple Lie groups of dimension 3 are SL2 and PSL2. There is nothing else is possible. So, I mean, our coverings of SL2. So, the assumption is that uh, if SL2 occurs at all as a factor, then the projection on that factor must be dense. If you do that, then gamma is rigid. I have been talking of rigidity of representation, but no. When I say gamma is rigid, I mean the inclusion of gamma in G is rigid. So, it also explains why it is difficult to construct discrete group with compact quotients in Lie groups other than PSL2. PSL2 historically they developed many discrete groups, but it was extremely difficult to find discrete groups. Uh, we, we showed one method using arithmetic, and it is natural that you should be if it is going to be rigid like this, everything has to have entries in number field. So, it is natural to take recourse to arithmetic to do this. So, this theorem is essentially due to. So, a corollary, of course, is that if G is an algebraic group defined over a number field. Actually, I do not have to say this because any algebraic group uh, ultimately is defined over a number field. If G is an, it may be, it, uh, my definition is defined over C, but you can always make sure that it is defined. Uh, maybe I have to be careful. It is a number field and gamma of course, number field K contained in R and gamma in GR is a discrete co compact subgroup. Then how G is an algebraic group? Algebraic semi simple group <laughs> combined GR is a discrete co compact subgroup and GR has no compact factors, compact or three dimensional factors. Then there exists G in G R such that G gamma G in West in G K for some number field no, G L for some number field with K contained in L contained in R. This once gamma is rigid, I mean, in fact, we proved stronger statement. Sorry, H1 gamma had that will imply rigidity. He may prove the strong statement H1 gamma at H0. And as a corollary, then you get this where the remarks I have already made. You have to work a little bit. Uh, the point is that you should have to look at the GR orbit already that will contain elements from a, which are entries in a number field. Okay. You do not have to go to the see once you the GC orbit does that, then use the inverse function theorem the usual way, and then you find you can find points which are real and in a number field. So it requires this little subtlety, but not uh, serious. So, this is the theorem of Weyl. Okay, and uh, how did Weyl prove such a theorem? I am going to give some broad indications of the proof. I will not uh, go into the details.
ओके यू हैव वी आर इंटरेस्टेड इन द फर्स्ट कोहमाजी ऑफ गामा कोफिशिएंट द जॉइंट रिप्रेजेंटेशन नाउ जी रिसेम्बल ग्रुप and let's fix a maximal compact k and g ah. i'll write in gr fix the maximal compact and let me write the m for gr by k now i have a discrete subgroup gamma and g see for proving that the vanish of the cohomology you can assume with a torsion generality that gamma is torsion free because we know that gamma contains subgroup finite index which is torsion and for the finite sub subgroup finite index the cohomology is zero then for the big group also the cohomology is zero because that can assume gamma is torsion free which implies that gamma acts fixed point free on m so we have the so not only that it acts properly discontinuously because the discrete subgroup of g and is compact you have m to m or gamma this is a compact locally symmetric space and this is the contractible space are you assuming gamma yeah. is a uniform lattice or something a co compact is what i have said here oh okay sorry i want to said that uh, oh in the corollary oh yeah yeah no. the corollary you are assuming no even here i need to assume gamma is discrete subgroup oh sorry discrete co compact that's all important that's what we proved in any case and because m is contractible standard theorem on topology tells you that h star gum uh, let me write uh, should say add the adjoint representation defines the locally constant sheaf on m or gamma and therefore we can talk of the cohomology of uh, the locally constant sheaf defines the locally constant sheaf let me call it uh, l then one has a natural isomorphism between the group cohomology with coefficients in the adjoint representation with the cohomology of the manifold with co m m by gamma with coefficients of the local system yeah. the standard isomorphism exists so if you want to prove a vanishing theorem for h1 here same thing as proving a vanishing theorem here and here we have new machinery available m or gamma is a natural riemannian manifold and the local system l you have a local system l and in which you can introduce a natural metric all of this will give rise to a laplacian and then once you have the laplacian on forms you have to prove you are supposed to be able to prove that no harmonic one forms you are done i'm applying hodge theory hodge theory is applicable in this context i'll say something more about that <coughs> for locally constant sheaves i want to apply hodge theory which you do exactly as you do for constant sheaf situation if you like so the vanishing theorem is proved you prove vanishing theorem by looking at the laplacian the lapla in principle what is done is to decompose laplacian into two parts this is so called bockner technique mm. you, you have uh, laplacian comes up in various uh, different uh, contexts and then suppose you are able to break, break the laplacian so let's call the laplacian delta suppose you are able to break it up into sum of two operators delta not which is the difference of operator plus an operator r which is a vector bundle homomorphism from differentiation from the 
vector bundle form of the uh, you have the vector bundle of uh, k forms delta is uh, elliptic uh, sorry delta is a differential operator from k forms into in itself delta not is also going to be same thing or is a vector bundle homomorphism of k forms into itself k forms with values in the local system into itself it's a, if you like it's a different operator of degree 0 for order order 0 these are second order operators usually and sometimes it's possible to break up delta and delta not plus r where this delta not is positive uh, non negative self adjoint delta is self adjoint this is delta delta one knows is non negative self adjoint still one can break up delta not which is non negative self adjoint plus an operator r which will depend on the curvature properties of the metric and so on mm -hmm. this operator r it turns out r of a uniform omega is a so form the same type and then at each point p you can form this in the product r of omega p omega p if this turns out to be strictly zero sorry hello Hello. Hello. Are you all are you shouting? There is no network. Uh, sorry, that's another camera. Okay, see. Hello. 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 Trick, uh, the Zokna Bokner trick is to decompose Laplace, which is possible sometimes, into a self adjoint. Uh, non negative operator plus an operator r which satisfies this condition. Once you have that condition, it is clear that delta phi phi, delta phi is 0, you do look at this integration delta phi phi. If this is 0, you find delta naught phi phi plus r phi phi. Now, delta naught phi phi is self adjoint and this is positive here. So, and if you integrate, you will still get something. So, this. So, Delta naught phi phi will give you something positive plus something which is also definite and this integral will not will have to be 0 which means that r omega p is 0 which means omega p is going to be 0 that is that is the way you prove this for every point p omega p is 0. In fact, uh, most vanishing theorems use this uh, Buckner technique as I say for example, the Quadra vanishing theorem again they break up the, uh, the elliptic operator into something which uh, depends on this uh, mm -hmm. curvature coming from the uh, Hermitian form which they use and so on. And Weil did something like this, but uh, in the first paper in which he proved the theorem, uh, he does not uh, say anything about harmonic forms and so on. Uh, hmm? In fact, uh, he writes some inequalities and in, uh, ultimate derivative, but he does not uh, put it this way. Mm -hmm. okay. 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 Uh, in fact, it was uh, put this way by Matsushima and Murakami okay. mm. and I also did it as around the same time. Mm -hmm. uh, Matsushima and Murakami did it in a more general uh, context. They, they, took, took to, not, they were not just doing with adjoint representation, they took any representation and uh, mm. and analyzed it and uh, I was looking only at the adjoint representation. That was my part of my thesis. Yeah. So, looking at the adjoint representation, I realized that this is what, what is happening. Osaka that, journal paper. Huh? Osaka journal paper. No, the, my, no, the, my uh, paper appeared in the, uh, my thesis appeared in the Journal of Mathematics and Mechanics, now okay. Indiana Journal, yeah. where this is, I, I essentially commented that what uh, Weil was doing was to decompose the Laplace and etc. Cetera, et cetera. It is proving a vanishing theorem for one form. At that time, uh, Weil had not mentioned cohomology at all. Okay. H1 gamma r equals 0 was not. In so, in fact, I interpreted these results as proving H1 gamma r is 0, and H1 gamma r by R Laplacian is what he was proving, etc. Et anyway, but uh, now uh, things usually people state things in this fashion. So, okay. <laughs> okay, I think we will stop now. Yeah. I will okay. come back and okay. So, let me say a few words about this function theorem, but before that, I would also 
like to say something little different. That is, I mean, something which will be interesting if the group is not rigid. The situation is this. Suppose uh, G is a connected Lie group. and gamma and g is a discrete subgroup. And as before, we do not be R gamma g, the space of all homomorphisms. Gamma and g, I yeah, will also assume gamma co-compact. Homomorphisms of uh, Gamma G. and it may denote by I the inclusion of gamma. G. Then what happens is this if gamma is co compact, this is again proved by Weyl, there exists a neighborhood U of I in R gamma G such that for all J in U, J gamma to G is injective, J gamma is discrete and G by J gamma is compact. That is, you deform the represent representation a little bit, you st it still continues to be a discrete subgroup with compact quotient. Mm -hmm. okay. And Okay, the way one proves is one way of proving this is the following. You look at uh, <coughs> G cross uh, R gamma G cross G cross G. And on this, make gamma operate like this by setting an element alpha here, <coughs> G H cred gamma will be G gamma. Here you put in H. Oh, sorry, keep alpha as such. G gamma H alpha gamma. Make gamma operate on this. And pass to the quotient. The quotient can be viewed. It's a family of G bundles on gamma on on R gamma G cross G mod gamma parameterized family of G bundles when G bundles on let's write G mod gamma parameterized by R, R gamma G. So it's a bundle on R gamma G cross G mod gamma. What you do is fix an alpha, then this is a diagonal action and you can think of the second factor G, second G acting by left multiplication will give you a principal G bundle. The second G acting only on this factor by left multiplication 
will give you a G bundle. So, you get a family of G bundles on R gamma G cross uh, family of G bundle G mod gamma are equivalently a bundle on R gamma G cross G mod gamma. That is a bundle on R gamma G cross G mod gamma. G bundle. Now, choose a contractible neighborhood of the point i in R gamma g. Then the bundle really becomes so. If choose u to be Contractible neighborhood of I in R gamma G. So let me call this uh, that is a bundle which I will give this a name P, a G bundle. So if I now look at P restrict to U cross. G mod gamma. U being contractible, this is isomorphic to uh, P naught, which is simply G cross G cross, sorry, yeah, G cross G. The diagonal action. That is. G G H gamma will be G gamma H gamma. We do not vary it, the fixed. The, <coughs> sorry, P, I should write size of the P naught cross because U is contractible, the bundle comes from. So, you yeah. interpret this, this means what? This means basically you have this implies your home of some phi. U for each U from P sub U, which by definition is P restricted to U cross G mod gamma to P. Have for every U. But this is here, the other words you have gamma action here, you have a u gamma action here, u, and they become compatible. And also, you can assume that it is uh, whole thing is dependent smoothly on u and so on. From that, it is not difficult to conclude that the mapping is it takes gamma to gamma u and is compatible with the u. <coughs> See, let me put it like this. The how do I say this? See, the, the whole thing is on this is equivalent to giving, saying the same thing as giving gives map of G. G with the uh, so phi u is what I called it phi u g gamma equals phi u g u gamma. You get such a map. And phi u, uh, when u is close to the original inclusion, phi u is going to be close to the identity. And you can make sure along with as many derivatives as you want, they are close. And on a compact set, therefore, you can ensure that phi u continues to be d phi u is injective. You can assume that, okay? And that means it is an immersion from g to g, d phi u is, you know, on the compact set is true, and then there is equivariance, therefore, it is true for all. You look at the map this way, 
rather than the other way around. Yeah, free. Right, right. It's true on a compact set, and therefore, in all translates by gamma, it will still be an immersion because of this equation. And therefore, it becomes an immersion everywhere. And then, similarly, you have to ensure its injectivity. You make ensure that it's inject, injected in the neighborhood of K, and then this will tell you it's injective everywhere. So, that gives you a diffeomorphism of G to G, which is compatible with gamma. Phi U is simply a diffeomorphism, is what I want to conclude. If it's sufficiently close to the identity, it is going to be along with some derivatives, then you are done. So, you just have to make sure that this map, uh, that this identification is a smooth map. Of course, it's a uh, little tricky because when you take uh, R gamma G, it's not clear what kind of structure it has. If it were a manifold, you are in good shape, but it may not be a manifold, but those are technical troubles. In any case, it won't definitely it says if you have one parameter family of uh, discrete groups, the quotient of youth, there will be no difficulty. So, nearby ones, uh, the, you, you get the same manifold G mod gamma. As a, as a smooth manifold, you get the same manifold G mod gamma. There is no difference nearby. But uh, for, you see, if you if your gamma, if G were a group of isometries, it is not clear that G mod gamma and G mod gamma, U gamma, gamma U may not be isometric. This only says there is a diffeomorphism. Okay, so that is an aside if you like. Okay, now getting back to Wales uh, theorem. Uh, <coughs> best way probably to talk about it is to introduce the work of Matsushima and Murakami. What they are looking at is the following. You have a group G, semi-simple, no compact factors and gamma discrete subgroup with G mod gamma compact. Actually, G mod gamma being compact is used, comes in, comes in only at the very end. Many things I am going to say will work with G mod gamma not compact. And suppose rho is a representation of G in some G L n or G L n r. And let K be a maximal compact subgroup. And also assume that gamma is going to be a torsion free subgroup, discrete subgroup. Then gamma acts on G mod K properly discontinuously and without fix and fixed point freely. Representation rho, let me write GL of vector space V rather than GL and C. Rho defines the local system or locally constant sheaf on G mod K or K. How does it work? The <coughs> for an open set U, let me write map G mod K to G mod gamma mod K. Let me call this map P. So for an open set U, uh, maybe I call this M and I call this X. For an open set U in X. 
local system l row l row of u is by definition all functions f from p inverse u to v such satisfying locally constant function f locally constant and f of x gamma i now I try to gamma on the rho gamma of x the v valued function satisfying this this by definition is the local system and you also have a vector bundle which i call e rho vector bundle again the sections of gamma u e rho sections vector bundle is nothing but same thing as above if you don't say p inverse u to v smooth plus f gamma x equals rho gamma f x this is a standard thing sir what is hypothesis and what is no this is the uh, so g is some simple group gamma discrete group with compact quotient torsion free and i look at also fix a representation k is a maximum compact subgroup g mod k is the manifold which i call m on this the group gamma operates and the quotient is here which i call x then i get for i define two things a vector is locally constant sheaf as well as a vector bundle the locally constant sheaf will consist of locally constant functions p inverse u to v such that f gamma x is rho gamma f x the vector bundle will consist of same thing except that f is smooth rather than yeah so vector bundle is got by simply looking at smooth functions so you obviously have uh, the sheaf l rho u has an inclusion in the vector bundle e rho and more generally you can define forms c infinity forms with values in l rho u or the same the same thing as you, the two things are same which i do not see infinity p forms which i do not denoted omega p rho what do i mean by this i take again same thing <coughs> for on an open set u over which the bundle is trivial or the rho system is trivial you simply take, think of them as forms with values or take take again the inverse image if you like and there are forms on that inverse image which transform like this so if you have omega as a form omega of x1 x2 xr apply gamma to each of these vectors you have pull out rho gamma inverse omega x1 these are tangent vectors x1 x2 xr vector fields on p inverse so that's p forms and then if you start with a section the usual exterior differentiation is going to make sense because the system is local because the transitions are by locally constant functions so you have a long sequence like the gram sequence you have the following exact sequence zero to l rho to e rho i i treat the vector bundle as a sheaf so e rho to omega 1 rho this will like is same as omega 0 rho and this is exact because of poincare lemma because locally l rho is a constant sheaf whatever applies to constant sheaf applies here so this is exact 
and the sheaves omega i rho are fine sheaves. I'm seeing for it is sheaves. And therefore, this is a fine resolution of L rho and you conclude that H star X L rho is isomorphic to cohomology of 0 to gamma omega omega 0 rho it is cohomology of this sequence. Now, the manifold M carries a gamma invariant metric, the symmetric Riemannian metric and therefore, so does x. So, let denote the symmetric Riemannian metric on x introduce the metric along the fibers of euro as follows. We choose this metric in a special way. What we do is to look at uh, See, E comes from a representation of rho from gamma to from G to G and V. <coughs> now, so G is a semi simple group and it is let it G be, G be the linear algebra and then this decomposes as a Cartan decomposition K plus P, K being the linear algebra as maximal compact, P the orthogonal complement of that. So, the corresponding group is k, maximal compact, the algebra of this. Now, whenever a representation, it turns out that there is an inner product on V such that induced representation the real algebra rho dot, let us call it rho dot of k is skew Hermitian and rho dot of p is Hermitian. There is such a representation. <coughs> Using this metric, we get Using this inner product, we get an inner product on zero on the fibers of zero. The way you think about it is. Uh, <coughs> Look at G mod K. First, look at G. <coughs> you have this quotient to G mod K, and then you have a further quotient to G mod K mod gamma. Now, here is K, and take the representation rho restrictive to K. <coughs> that leaves invariant Hermitian product on that. So, this is the principal K bundle, and you can get the associated bundle on which you have a metric along the fibers. So, you, so here you get a bundle which I will call E and then further this on this gamma operates on see gamma acts on the left commuting the action of K. So, gamma acts on this vector bundle preserving the Hermitian inner product and therefore, you get a Hermitian inner product on the quotient which is 0.
So, we have the following data, you have a metric on the manifold X and the metric along the fibers, the Hermitian in the product along the fibers of the vector bundle E rho. These together will enable you to define a Laplacian. You have the operator D, you can define an adjoint. The adjoint is simply, what you have to do is to, there is a usual star operator on forms, okay. Star inverse D star is the delta, but now it forms with values in the vector bundle, but then you use the inner product on the vector bundle also and therefore you will get a, so you have this star, it will go from scalar forms, scalar P forms to M minus P forms. And you have the other inner, inner product on the, on E, which I do not know what, uh, how do I, do? maybe I write simply U, oh no, uh, yes, let me call it, which will go from E to E star. So, start with the form, apply star only on the form part, not on the fiber you will end up in M minus P form with various in C, but then apply this now, you get into E rho star. So, you will get a mapping which takes, uh, and then you can, you can identify E rho as uh, bundles or, con con I mean, you will have an anti isomorphism if you like between E rho and E rho star because of the product. Okay. So, in a, the upshot of all this, you can form the star inverse, and then this S, D, star that will go from omega p e rho yeah, omega q e rho to omega q minus 1 and it is going to the adjoint of the operator d. So, you have uh, did I write it down or d from going from omega you have the operator d uh, d here. This one denotes this by delta. Uh, I am afraid there is a sign here which I will always, I am never sure about. It is a plus minus, you have to put in the right sign. If you put in the right sign, delta and D become adjoint operators in the sense that D phi psi linear product integration is same as integral phi delta psi for phi psi with compact support, which is when it makes sense. Of course, when the manifold is compact, it makes sense of it. You have a unique operator and delta is denoted d delta plus delta d. Okay. Now, yeah. See the there is a, another thing which we can do. See, you have omega one. So, so omega p rho two. You know we have uh, <coughs> gets a little involved. Omega P rho tensor you have a connection on the vector bundle. Oh, sorry, you have a connection on the Riemannian connection on the manifold. Now, there is also a natural connection of the vector bundle, okay. I will come to that. See, when you have associated representation, uh, you know, the point is uh, there is a flat connection mm. on the vector bundle. Mm. Oh, so, okay. because it's associated with the rho is the representation, so you get a flat connection on the vector bundle. Mm. Together, they give you a connection, uh, the, 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 together they enable you to define an operator delta which goes from omega p rho to omega 1. The use the 
you know, you use the Riemannian connection to get from omega p to omega p rho tensor. Sorry, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, no, if, if you have scalar forms, scalar p forms, you can apply the Riemann connection, then from you get into scalar forms, tensor uh, one forms, scalar, ten, scalar p forms, tensor scalar one forms. You are throwing in the vector bundle, so you want to get this, you have to use the connection there also. Together, you get an operator like this. And then you can introduce the adjoint to this. Formally, you can introduce the adjoint of you, you insist on the formula that nabla phi psi is which goes in the other direction, nabla star phi nabla star psi. Such an operator always exists in local coordinates if you write the usual uh, A alpha, D alpha, etc. You can get the adjoint operator. So now look at nabla star nabla. That give you a mapping omega p rho to omega p rho. And that's obviously a positive non, non uh, negative self adjoint operator. Because yes. the same thing, see nabla phi phi, sorry, nabla star nabla phi phi. If you have to push, push it the other side, you get nabla phi nabla phi. So that will be self adjoint. So you get a one self adjoint operator here, it's another self adjoint operator. So, write delta S nabla star nabla plus R. It turns out this R is a pure scalar operator. The point is they have the same symbol. So, the top terms disappear, but first order terms also disappear. So, you get and this is something which will depending on the, depend on the representation of the curvature of the manifold and so on. And it is for this you have to get an inequality. For this, you prove that this is a positive, positive. some different under suitable conditions. For the adjoint representation, it works right. For the adjoint representation of all groups other than SL2, all non symmetrical groups other than SL2, it works right R for the adjoint representation. And uh, you can also write down, one can kind of say which are the representations for which R is positive. It turns out that. Uh, R is greater than 0 for all non trivial representations of groups other than non trivial, other, non -trivial representations uh, of groups other than SUN1 and SON1. If you leave out this, it turns out this R is positive definite. And therefore, you get a Banach theorem for all representations, not just the adjoint representations, for all representations for these groups. Even for SUN1 and SYN1, one can write down which are the representations for which this form is not positive okay. definite. So, you do get to most of the representations, it turns out the cohomology vanishes. The ones, for instance, uh, for SUN1 and SYN1, what will fail? is the natural representation. Those fail and also uh, if you take the, if you take natural representation, the highest symmetric power, uh, inside that there will be a irreducible representation. That will, for that it will fail. The, post, the form will not be positive. Right? Other than that, everything is else okay. It's a, you know, basically it's, anyway, that, that's a kind of, uh, those are my results incidentally. It's, uh, for general representations. And in fact, what happens is here, there is something more. Uh, so, even when uh, there are situations, if the, if the quotient is not compact, then what can you say? Hodge theory does not exist. You cannot do very much with it. However, it turns out that if you can, uh, if, if you have a form, if this condition is satisfied, if this R is possible definite, and if uh, a cohomology class can be represented by a square integral form, a form phi is a non compact manifold. Yes. So, integral phi in a part of the system does not make sense in general. Suppose it is bounded, yes. then 
it's necessarily a co-boundary. So if every cohomology class can be represented with square integral form, then the cohomology vanishes. So the presence of this R takes care of that. Basically, the point is that delta omega omega start, will start making sense. If uh, omega is a square integral form, this delta omega omega will basically make sense and this will also make sense. And therefore, it is vanishing will be guaranteed by this presence of this. This is the kind of thing that uh, 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 Andriyurthi and Vesanthini developed in the context of complex manifolds. They called this uh, the presence of this kind of thing. Of course, it is again Bokhtner technique. Uh, basically, it is Bokhtner technique and Matsushima Murakami did this in this context. They, you know, these things happen almost simultaneously. Matsushima Murakami was uh, looking at this and they were looking at complex manifolds and what they call Q convexity, stuff like that. Anyway, so this is the rough idea. I do not think uh, I need to go into more details. It is uh, not very <laughs> illuminating to say more. So anyway, the basic idea is to decompose Laplace in like this and it works. It is uh, why it works, I, I do not know and I am not sure that anybody who has been dealing with this really knows why it works. It's, you know, but you know, the, in some sense, the whole thing uh, stands by a slender thread. You know, it is something you want to prove that is possible different. Maybe you make a mistake, it is not really possible, but you prove, you think you have proved it. <laughs> and <laughs> whole thing will crash and crash any time if you have made a mistake. <laughs> you know, the sign it's always a little uh, dicey, but it seems to have worked. It's uh, so getting that no, point, also is this R I, I could interpret R entirely in Lie algebra terms. Okay. And that's how I could prove its partial definiteness. It's it depends only on the representation and things that kind. So, that is the way it goes.